Hey everyone, welcome to the industry show. I'm your host Nitin Bajaj and joining us today is Panish Murthy. Panish, yeah. thanks for having us here. My pleasure, completely. And uh, like my friend MR says, I always find a really beautiful home <laughs> and this is one of the very best. So thanks for hosting us here. My pleasure. We got lucky with this house because it's at the edge of the hill. So we get lovely views all yeah. the way from San Jose to we, San Fran. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> and a beautiful day, so we chose to sit outside. Uh, so tell us, you know, about you, your, where were you born, about your parents? Ah, I was born in Ahmedabad. Okay. And uh, my father uh, was an engineer. Mm -hmm. uh, he retired as a head of a systems engineering division of Kirloskar. So it was a very engineering focus, okay. electrical engineer. So he has always... Uh, been um, quite close to what he studied mm -hmm. uh, in many ways and uh, he also was very keen that uh, I learn and become an engineer although my first preference was actually to be a doctor and really? uh, <laughs> you know but I ended up doing engineering and then I did my business my mother actually uh, studied chemistry uh, mm -hmm. uh, very early on in her mm -hmm. bachelor's but after that she became a homemaker, okay. so she hasn't been working, but uh, I still remember the early days when uh, she used to actually sit down with me on my homework and uh, every time I made a mistake, I would get a little rap on the knuckles <laughs> to say, hey, that's wrong, you know, <laughs> better correct it. And uh, I think a lot of that uh, work ethic uh, really was taught to me by my mother in terms right. of being diligent about my yeah. work and my homework and all of those things. So was um, going to the IIT kind of a foregone conclusion for you as far as you know, within your parents and you? I don't know if going to IIT was a foregone conclusion for anybody <laughs> uh, because I always wanted to do medicine. Okay. And uh, in those days when I was there, the IIT program was a five-year mm -hmm. uh, program. Right. So you could apply after 11th. Right. And I got in with a really good rank which allowed me to get any subject I wanted in any uh, IIT I wanted. Right. Uh, you know, and I still wanted to go for my medicine, but that I had to wait for one more year and then there was yeah. no certainty and right. peer pressure and all of that stuff happened and everybody said, you're crazy not to take this <laughs> up when you got the when you got in and so on and so forth. So yeah. I think it just ended up being bad. In fact, even after my IIT, I wanted to make the switch to medicine. Mm. So okay. I did end up applying for an MD degree in the US because in the US, anyway, you do your MD degree after, after your bachelor's. Right. Uh, uh, so. I ended up getting uh, admission in a few really good colleges, but no financial assistantship for yeah. the MD degree. Yeah. And there was one particular program which did give me uh, financial assistantship. It was about $400 uh, mm -hmm. a month plus a tuition waiver. And I wasn't sure whether that was adequate or not. And I didn't yeah. want to put a more burden on my parents right. and stuff like that. So we just, uh, so I, apparently I had written the CAT and I got into, I, you know, all the IMs. Yeah. So I go, chose to go to IMA, which was a great decision. Yeah. Right, uh, worked out looking uh, back, really well. Yeah. Yes, it was a fantastic decision looking back. So, and and looking at the healthcare system here, you you probably don't regret not being a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can always take pot shots at the healthcare system every country, <laughs> but you know, you got to say at least the response and uh, the care is actually very good in the U.S. Right. Uh, it is very expensive, right? But the quality of care quality is really good. Yes. Is really good and true. You know, if if I ever have any problem, touch wood, which I don't have right now, but if I ever have any problem, You're I would think this is the this is yes. the right country to be in to take care of that problem. So let's do a quick uh, rapid fire. Sure. Right? Talking about healthcare and and being health conscious, uh, there is a rumor that you did some extreme sports. So tell us about that. <laughs> well, you know, there was a point of time in my life, uh, probably about uh, seven eight years ago, when I was. Uh, really trying to get myself more and more comfortable with all my fears. Mm -hmm. So I had a fear of uh, heights. Uh, yeah. So I ended up doing uh, skydiving and rappelling oh. and cliff jumping. Nice. You know, so it, it was just trying to overcome my own fears. And grow as a person. And uh, yeah. grow as a person. And also, you know, uh, seeing how I respond to myself yes. uh, when I'm putting myself in a zone of discomfort. Right. You know, and, and I think uh, that's what happened. And then, you know, I also... Um, you know, being the parent of now three children, right. uh, didn't particularly care for speeds, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, I've been a relatively defensive driver, I would say, yeah. particularly having uh, grown up in India and learning driving in <laughs> India, you get to be a defensive right. driver, right? You don't know when something is going to dart across right. from where. You, you always have like almost one foot on the brake all yes. the time. Uh, so I 
did take part in the car race and okay. uh, it was a poor performance uh, <laughs> but at least i learned a little more about myself uh, <laughs> so that is what it was nice so. and then uh, you also uh, well before i go to the specific question uh, any specific books or uh, the last two books you read well you know uh, for my uh, i read books really for distraction and lighter reading mm-hmm. so it's got to have uh, probably a gruesome murder in the first 2 3 okay. pages and uh, the body is displayed in a particular way yeah. which means and a message to the, the police mystery. officer <laughs> and you know all of that stuff so it's it's really the michael connelly's the james yeah. uh, patterson's you know it's yeah. that that flavor mystery, of books which yeah. I, uh, okay. it's murder mysteries which i generally nice. read for uh, and have uh, you solved most of them before the end oh no no i don't <laughs> think so well i mean and many of them you know you know who the murderer is but it's just a question of how somebody will actually right. catch them right, right. so right. so that's the angle yeah So what's one thing that you own that you wish you didn't? Oh one thing that I own that I wish I didn't. Wow, that's incredible. Uh I actually now own do I do own some laptops and all that I wish I didn't because now <laughs> all my work is done on these uh, devices, <laughs> handheld devices uh, uh which are there. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh what is the favorite store you shop at the most? I think I would probably say that's Nordstrom's because okay. that's where I do most of my yeah. shopping. Yeah. Yeah. Good answer. Mm. Okay. Well, switching gears, uh, tell us about your uh, time with uh, Infosys. You know, you're widely credited as a person who grew it from being a, you know, decent-sized company to a like one of the large caps in in IT uh, coming from India and worldwide. So, give us a maybe, you know. You know, it was a very interesting uh, uh, stint at Infosys. I would say mm-hmm. they went from uh, zero to about one one point three million dollars mm-hmm. in ten years. Right. So eighty one to ninety one. That's yes. what they had gone. And then um, um, you know, I saw an ad uh, actually uh, for uh, Infosys, which said we also you know the ad was software engineer, this that, mm-hmm. systems analyst, programmer, etc. etc. And there was one line which also said. we also want marketing managers to be based <laughs> globally okay. right that's all it was a very loose it was a very loose thing. and clearly this is a company in my mind that needed desperate help for marketing right. and i considered myself uh, more in that line rather than on the programming line because i'd never written a line you of code you're at sonata at this point i was at sonata at yeah. this point of time always you know sonata was also a startup so right. my my yes. mind has always been in very entrepreneurial kind yes. of ventures um and actually so when um um when um i reached out to them and they reached out to me mm-hmm. vice versa what happened was that uh they gave me a canvas which was you know you can go from sydney to san francisco which is really a broad <laughs> canvas you do, we don't mind you going to hong kong we don't mind you go to singapore yes. uh, etc it to pick paris whatever new york etc etc and i chose california a because of the technology hub and uh, at that point my salary was $40,000 a year because yeah. that's all they could afford <laughs> and i figured that uh, everybody told me that's kind of like below poverty line <laughs> so i figured that if uh, i have to mooch off somebody my sister lived in uh, california <laughs> so just easier to mooch off family and that's how i ended up in california and it was a really good decision it's the home of technology right as we right. found and so you were primarily based in the us bringing us business back to india correct and uh, so what was the scale i mean you you were with infosys for 7 8 years 10 years 10 years uh, so between 92 and 2002 mm-hmm. um uh, was very much uh, leading the team which uh, took the company from just a little under 2 million dollars to about mm-hmm. 750 million dollars in wow. revenue so that was a you know phenomenal growth yes. uh, there were years when we had uh, 80 to 120% growth uh, yes. it was just a, a fascinating world and uh We, you know the uh, we went public on two exchanges in that right. time frame yes. uh, one in india and, and really we raised money in india to build a building yes. because we didn't have money to build right. a building and to hire a few more sales people uh, because i couldn't afford to pay anybody and you know of course it's always difficult by that time actually by the time i started hiring my salary had gone up to a whopping $44000 <laughs> so you know it was quite interesting but uh, getting listed on nasdaq was quite a bit of a high because we yes. were the first indian company right. to list on a us exchange correct and since i was the only uh, no uh, officer outside india mm-hmm. i actually led that whole thing right. so it was quite an interesting experience. experience it was an amazing experience and i remember we were graduating at that point and you know infosys was hiring in the thousands yes right 500 people here a thousand <laughs> over there 
amazing growth and you got to be right see, at the heart of yeah. it see actually what happened i think you know the, it was a, it was a really fascinating time because i believe i was not just part of a company in the making yeah. i believe i was very much part of an industry in the making yes. because the indian it industry yes. but more importantly i actually do believe i was also part of a country in the making at that time True. because if you look before 92 india was yes, really nowhere closed. on the map right. you know it was just no nowhere on the yes. map and you know at least today uh whether it's good or bad there's a stereotype that somebody sees an indian on the road he must be good at math <laughs> engineering and software you know that's that's i've benefited from that yeah <laughs> <laughs> and and i'm saying that it's just a stereotype I, I, so india has at least got a brand it's got a niche yes. and my thinking had always been you know uh, when we had such a large population mm-hmm. and the economy uh, in india is not that large right so if you want to generate employment uh, for all of these people effectively you do need to look at the world for generating that employment right. and i was just happy that i was able to take one industry and right. really prove that because we created millions of jobs uh, in that industry uh, for indians and yes. it was i think very good jobs mm-hmm. in the sense that uh, they got paid quite a bit there was a lot of travel uh, it was highly respected i mean you know it was clearly highly respected because yeah. i used to get uh, uh, people who were joining uh, in infosys and later on in igate when i used to do some breakfast meetings with them mm-hmm. uh, you know the girls would turn around and tell me you know i joined uh, the software industry because my father said if i join this i have to pay less dowry <laughs> and then the guys would turn around and say that you know I, i'll get a higher dowry which was which was shocking but you know but at least it shows you that the industry had uh, evolved, uh, had uh, yeah. evolved and had come a long way and you know being one of the uh, aspirants coming into the industry I knew that that's what the thinking was not mm. in terms as much as for the dowry but just even from a work culture perspective right that was very transformative for the country uh, because before then it was you know you just slog right yeah and i think it it, it opened up avenues for engineers of multiple disciplines right. and it was yeah. i i i think we did well as an industry yes. we really did well yes so after infosys you started quintant yes right uh, So tell us about that and also the the relatively short very Stinted quick printed. acquisition of Quinton. Yeah. So actually it's interesting because what happened was that uh, if I look at all the criticism that was leveled at Infosys mm-hmm. it was probably less an indictment of Infosys but more an indictment of the industry that we were mm-hmm. operating in. Right. You know I used to hear things like uh, you know you guys are putting young kids on the job mm-hmm. yes that was our model right. uh, you guys are learning at our expense uh, yes i mean in a sense that was our model uh, you are not quite as productive as uh, we are and so mm. on and so forth so the whole uh, it it seemed to me that customers were getting tired of paying for effort and i wanted to create mm. a completely new paradigm where clients would start paying for results and for right. outcomes right. rather than for uh, effort Right. and that's why quintent was born um, right. and you know i raised 30 million dollars in mm-hmm. venture capital to start quintent mm-hmm. and it was to create the first outcomes uh, company outcome based yeah okay. it was outcome based services okay. so the idea was that we would not charge anything for actual work mm-hmm. we would charge everything for the results that we Once, produce yeah and one of the first things that we started was uh, working in the mortgage industry mm mm-hmm. and uh, the us mortgage industry uh, was very inefficient was very paper centric uh, very manual and mm-hmm. so on and so forth and we brought a very cool technology set of solutions to this industry mm-hmm. and we were able to take the entire process from application through funding mm-hmm. um, and we were able to apply various technology interventions to that process and reduce the cost very dramatically so we were outsourcing that entire process right. with our technology mm-hmm. and were charging out at probably less than 50% or wow. uh, what less, the bank yeah. was uh, earlier paying and because it was in an outcome based model they had they loved the model mm-hmm. right so we could ratchet it up mm-hmm. uh, in those days i had actually coined a, coined a term called uh, business services provisioning right so it was really where you could ratchet it up uh, if i need 5000 mortgages today mm-hmm. i'll do that if right. i want 3000 tomorrow i'll do that and you know so it, it right. was it was quite an interesting model that's awesome yeah so how did that uh, acquisition happen how how did you kind of uh, uh, the match making happen with igate well you know see igate was a, a pretty poorly run mm-hmm. loss making yes. company it was minus 20% right. uh, operating margin uh, poor reputation known as a staffing company yes. 
and uh, it, but it was public, mm -hmm. and the market cap was about 65 million or right. 70 million dollars. It was yes. listed on Nasdaq, yes. 65 or 70 million dollars. And what happened was that the iGate uh, uh, founders and the iGate board had always been after me to come in and join as CEO, and I had started okay. my own stuff. And so you know, that was already going on in the background. It, uh, it had happened before I started uh, my but, company, yeah. but they continued to pursue. And I said, look, I've already started my company. They said, right. we'll buy your company. And for me, the attraction was actually that if you have a larger platform and a public company, mm -hmm. it's easier for financial institutions to do business with you than as a startup. Right. And therefore, from my perspective, I think I also said, okay, sure. it's, it's not you a bad a bigger thing. bigger platform. And bigger platform, and I was running it anyway. Correct. And I was able to clean that company, you know, from, uh, you know, over the next 10 years. It was mm -hmm. quite interesting because I took that from about a negative 20% margin to a 25% operating margin. Wow. Uh, from about $65 million uh, enterprise uh, value to about $4 billion yes. of enterprise value. Yes. So it was a really interesting ride uh, there. It was a lot of cleanup. Right. And at that point, so when, when you uh, took over, uh, you talked about the revenues and the, and the margins. Uh, how big was the company in terms of employees and, and the scope of operations? So they were listed here. What were the bigger markets? Uh, they, they were listed uh, in the U.S. and the markets were Australia, Canada, U.K. and the U.S. Okay. Uh, but it was all largely staffing. So right. actually over the course of the next four or five years, I got rid of all of the staffing business. Hmm. So we sold U.K. staffing, we sold Australian staffing, Canadian staffing and we spun off the U.S. staffing. Mm -hmm. So in effect, grew something pretty close to from ground zero okay. um, and took that. Uh, I took that to about $280 million organically. Wow. And then what happened was that uh, uh, we decided to acquire Putney, Putney Computers yes. at that time. And that was huge. Right? That, that was, that was big the biggest bet. deal at that time. Yeah, it was yeah. a big bet. Yeah. Uh, but it was interesting. You see why? Because what happened was, it was a fascinating acquisition in many ways. Uh, because the although iGate was 280 million in revenue roughly, mm -hmm. and Putney was about 650, 670 million right. in revenue almost roughly. Almost three times, yeah. Yeah, almost three times. But our market caps were the same because Putney was growing very slowly yes. and their margins were much lower than I get. Got it. So we were growing faster and our margins were higher. So our market cap was actually roughly the same. Hmm. And because it was the first acquisition we did, uh, and because the iGate shareholders did not want to be diluted, right. I decided to do the acquisition through public debt, hmm. which was never, never heard of in yes. the IT yeah. industry. Yeah. So I took one point two raised one point two billion dollars mm -hmm. in public bonds. And I, uh, you know, that's how we did the acquisition, and, and only three hundred and twenty million dollars in equity through a private equity player. So, so the uh, the dial the increase in um, earnings to shareholders was very very yes. dramatic over the yes. course of the next four or five years. How how did you even, you know, like think of it? I mean, it's it's like so out of the you know realm. <laughs> so is that something that uh, you know you had had an eye on, or like what what was the genesis and you know. Once you figure that out, then you know getting the thing done is is a whole other you know gambit. But just even yeah. thinking about something, you know, you could acquire yeah. a company three times your size. Yes. I mean, just so out of the. Well, actually, you know, um, uh, when we were bidding, see, uh, uh, although iGate was a small company, mm -hmm. uh, our aspirations were not small. True. Right, and I have always believed that aspirations are one of the largest part of where you will end up in life. Mm -hmm. um, you know. I used to argue with my dad all the time that the Indian middle class values are terrible <laughs> because it's all about sacrifice. You know, I won't have the piece of chocolate so my son can have it. I, you know, I won't go to holidays so that my daughter can go to school. <laughs> if your middle class value was aspiration, you would have figured out a way to do both. Yes. So you would have innovated a lot more. Right. Anyway, so uh, our aspirations are not small. So we looked at uh, Satyam. When Satyam went into yes. the crisis, yes. we looked at Satyam. But I found two things. I was completely unprepared. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of figuring out what all it takes to do a transaction of that type. And secondly, I also found that I felt that the core competencies that were required to make that acquisition successful were not mine. Hmm. It was all about fighting class action lawsuits. It was yes. all about, you know, the legal hassles right. that were there, etc., cetera, et cetera. Uh, And I just felt, okay, we're just not ready and it's not my core competence. And you don't want so to spend stopped. your energy there. Yeah, I didn't want right. to spend my energy there. So the next opportunity that came up, which was uh, uh, Putney, yeah. I said, yeah, we, we, you know, we were ready then, uh, we had got more ready, right. and, uh, you know, it was a simple matter of working better solutions for customers, doing more interesting things and stuff like that. So, 
in hindsight, uh, do you think the, the acquisition, obviously it worked out, uh, but should you have done more? Should you have gone after some others? Maybe if not a Satyam, some, someone else. I mean, because you did look at a couple others at that point. I think uh, uh, clearly uh, if you are good at integration, mm -hmm. acquisitions is a tremendous way to grow. Yes. Uh, it allows you to expand your client base, exp allows you to expand your solution base right. and so on. Um, I have, I think, uh, become a big fan of uh, acquisition-led growth mm -hmm. uh, over time, but it should be sitting on top of an organic engine. Correct. It yeah. can't be that acquisition is going to solve your problems. Right. If you don't have any problems, an acquisition can help you quite help dramatically. Right. Yeah. So, you know, switching gears just a bit, uh, in your time at Infosys and iGate, there were a couple of cases uh, that were, you know, settled. Uh, I would love to hear any life lessons that came out of that for you. You know, it's interesting. Yeah, I think the life lessons that came out of that probably for me were stay focused, um, you know, keep yourself grounded in reality. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, just continue to embrace diversity. I think it's it's all right. Uh, but yes, it, they were troubling times for me, no doubt about it. Right. Uh, but, I, you know, I think uh, I am generally a very positive-minded, optimist kind of a guy. You know, I'm the kind of guy who, if I take a fall from 60 floors after 59 floors, will probably say, so far, so good. <laughs> you know, so I'm an optimist. So yeah. I always look at the positive and I always see the what good next? in things and yeah. good in people. So I, I believe that uh, that's how that actually has helped me um, come out of all of that stuff uh, much, much stronger and much better. And that's probably what led you to this introspection of finding and uh, facing your fears, right? Oh yeah, that's also true, yes yeah. indeed. So uh, now you lead uh, Prime Mentor, tell, tell us a bit more about uh, what Prime kind Mentor. of consulting and what kind of work you do. So Prime Mentor is an advisory firm, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I do uh, things like, so now in this avatar of uh, my life, what mm -hmm. I want to do is try and make multiple entrepreneurs mm -hmm. who have started businesses many years ago, mm -hmm. but have reached uh, probably in their mind kind some of kind of a plateau or right. some kind of a saturation level. And uh, my goal is to try and see for people who have spent a lot of time in the industry, mm -hmm. can I help them actually leapfrog in value? Can I help them in uh, get a really good return for what they have done and of course uh, for me also uh, right. you, know, not, uh, yeah. you know it's not just a pure social cause but right. I'm just saying that um, but if you can combine a good uh, uh, cause with also uh, you know fair amount of money for yourself mm -hmm. it's nothing wrong with that in my mind so I think uh, uh, that's what I do so I, I help uh, entrepreneurs so I've actually helped multiple companies mm -hmm. uh, uh, scale in value very dramatically and created exits also for some companies. Okay. So that's what we do. Plus I also help uh, companies on the larger side, the mm -hmm. uh, uh, large companies. So I'm working with a large insurance company and in trying to digitally transform themselves, come out of a hundred year old kind of a Legacy culture to system. a more the yeah. digital uh, 21st century kind of a culture. And is this uh, in, in the US? It's in the US, okay. yes it is. And you also serve on a few boards. I do, I serve, well I mean my work that I do with these uh, younger companies, smaller mm -hmm. companies is by actually becoming a board member right. and being a very active board member. So right. it's not like I'm a once a quarter, right. uh, just show I'll up just come and, and just come up right. and so on and so forth. I'm quite engaged, I quite uh, try and Hands set on. focus, yeah. uh, uh, try and do direction setting and uh, do regular reviews to keep the cadence and the pace going. Got it. So, you serve as a mentor for a lot of others. Have you yourself used a, a mentor or a coach? No, not really. Not ever. But the two people I think uh, I must confess that I have been most uh, influenced in my life mm -hmm. uh, were Narayan Murthy and of Nandan. Yeah. Um, uh, Nandan was just a, uh, 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 was my boss uh, in Infosys. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, just a incredible gentleman. I mean, just an incredible gentleman in the sense that uh, uh, I, I remember uh, some of the statements that he made to me. Uh, it was reflective of his, of his attitude, uh, but it just showed so much comfort and security in himself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I had once called uh, a little late at my night, and I called him, and he said, "If you're just calling to give me an update, forget it. I don't need any updates from you. Uh, if you need any help, just let I'm me know. Here, yes. I, I, I'm here to help you." Wow. And I thought that's incredible, you know, in an age where, generally speaking, managers are always looking for updates, tell me what's going on, I right. want to know what's going on, yes. and all of that stuff. He was completely the opposite. And, very you know, secure. Yeah, he was very, yeah. very comfortable and secure. And actually, I think it was his 
ability to let go in many ways which actually helped uh, as provide you the air cover provide you the support yes. but at the same time let go actually helped uh, everybody grow as individuals uh, also and uh, Murthy was also just another incredible uh, gentleman. I mean, my relationship with Murthy was very, very close. I mean, he was, uh, 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 you know, no, he, he was amazing. In the same uh, conversation, we could go from uh, why is that salesperson spending six dollars more on something to trying to figure out what is the right way to solve world hunger or world <laughs> poverty. You know, it was such a and broad that canvas that of, uh, yeah. yeah, and he was, his thinking was just uh, completely at a different He's level. He's such a father figure in so many ways. He is. He is actually a very, very uh, paternal yes. figure. You're right. And yes. uh, it had uh, a little bit of bearing on the Infosys culture also as a very yes. paternal kind of a culture, which obviously as you grew, uh, you yes. know, was found uh, wanting. Okay. But, uh, uh, but definitely in the initial phase, it was actually quite uh, useful. What drives you? What motivates you? You know, you, you've accomplished so many things in life and, and it's not like, you know, you're sitting back and, and taking it all in. So what keeps you motivated? No, I think uh, for me, you know, as long as I can uh, continue to make a difference to people's lives, I mm -hmm. will continue to do that. And that's something which uh, does drive me. Uh, the fact that uh, uh, I can create multiple successes even in a fairly crowded industry, that continues to drive me. The yeah. challenge of that continues to drive me. So in fact, uh, now my goal is to try and uh, set up something which everybody claims is impossible to do uh, mm -hmm. uh, because I have been advising these companies uh, yeah. so now the thinking is can I do this as a private equity fund mm. so we are uh, uh, my two partners Hari, Hitesh and myself mm -hmm. uh, we are actually raising a fund uh, to try and do exactly what I have been doing but to take some ownership in this company so that mm -hmm. the value return so somebody told me it's impossible to set up a first time fund so I said okay mm. well then you got to try it it's impossible to set up a first-time fund and you're not even from that industry. Well, okay, so you got to try it, right? <laughs> right? I mean, you know, and uh, uh, so far at least um, most of the things that I have tried uh, have turned out to be successful. Yeah. I had uh, one um, big uh, learning moment from something which didn't work, which was Ziggy, the my, pharma, healthcare, yeah. my healthcare venture yeah. in India. I found that the... Uh, Indian regulatory environment uh, just not ready yet. Uh, was just not ready and also I also found in many ways I have become probably a little too American for India <laughs> you know in the sense that uh, I'll tell you you know we had a very strict process insisting on prescriptions mm -hmm. uh, we used to send all the medication in 20 degrees centigrade cooled containers right. uh, and so on and so forth and the consumer was not willing to pay for any of these things. Yeah. Right? You know, the consumer wanted, wanted just... Quick uh, yeah, and cheap. That's quick it. and cheap. And, you know, uh, I, when I talk to many of the pharma manufacturers, I said, you know, many of these guys are sending drugs across at 44 degrees centigrade, yeah. which is in, you know, North India, it's quite right. common. Yeah. I said, what will happen? They said, we don't know what will happen to those drugs. So, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, so the point is that uh, there was just a little too much of quote-unquote compliance in me. Right. Uh, uh, and uh, I think it was... Uh, uh, it was... Maybe I realized that it was, uh, so even had we raised, so we didn't actually end up raising external institutional capital mm -hmm. uh, because of probably the regulatory uh, uh, concerns which right. everybody had. Right. But I'm now almost sure that even had we raised institutional capital, we were just spending too much on things which the consumer just didn't want. They didn't appreciate it. Yeah. Our I technology mean, they, platform they was... They want it, but they don't appreciate it. Yeah. Are they right. not willing to pay for it? Correct. Let me put it right. that way. Our, right. our technology platform was foolproof, yes. state of the art. Our whole uh, quality control checks. We were trying to do traceability because mm -hmm. one of the biggest problems was that 30-35% uh, of drugs in North India are spurious. Wow. So, we wanted to beat that. So, we were trying to do traceability from a manufacturer's batch number all down the way to the down door. to the consumer. Yeah. Nobody's willing to pay for all that. See, that's the whole problem, yeah. right? So that's what uh, happened. So going back to this uh, private equity fund, mm. where are you at uh, with, with that? Uh, actually, so we just uh, started the initial okay. process. Uh, we are very close to getting an anchor investor now. And uh, we hope that once we get our anchor investor, we'll hit the road and start. Because for the first time, I mean, you know, uh, I agree that uh, it's. I'm trying to take on impossible things but I do want to do it smartly yes and everybody says you can if you get an anchor investor first then then, you, then you increase your probability dramatically so that's really what uh, I'm trying to do now so aside from the the PE fund what are you most excited about in life right now 
I think uh, right now I am very excited about uh, the stage where all my three kids are at. Yeah. It's, it's interesting, <laughs> you know, because my eldest son uh, did one job switch. Uh, mm -hmm. He's working in a hot company. He's a computer scientist. He's working in a hot company in AI ML, which is about yep. in the artificial intelligence right. line, which is about as uh, uh, good and current uh, as yes. can be. Yep. Uh, my younger son uh, is uh, has just spent uh, the first uh, year of his working life mm -hmm. slogging till 1 a.m., 2 a.m. Yep. in the financial <laughs> services industry. <Yep. laughs> And he's struggling and understanding what it takes to be in the financial right. industry. And I do believe that both of them now have a slightly better appreciation of what I was going yes. through when I was working and so on. Right. And my daughter is uh, just five, so she's yes. in this still happy-go-lucky world. And, yes. uh, you know, it's great to, to... And I'm going back to all of these Disneyland and yep. Sea Worlds <laughs> and all of those things through her eyes, which is fantastic again. That is so awesome. Me. So how has your Indian ethnicity shaped you know, the decisions you've made and uh, career or personal? Oh, I think uh, the fact that you're from India mm -hmm. uh, definitely shapes you in certain ways. And for example, I am definitely now a quote-unquote value player. Right. In India, we always look yes. for value. Yes. So the Plutus Fund, which we're talking mm -hmm. about uh, with this private equity fund, actually is a value play. So the idea yes. is that we reach out to entrepreneurs who haven't, uh, uh, who are not growing at 40% a year, right. who are not 25% margins, right? right? So, and right. who may be growing at 5-6% a year, right. maybe at 8-10% margin, and kick. they need to yeah. get to that next level. Right. So that's kind of what uh, we want to do. So I think that has really come from the Indian roots, uh, yeah. uh, that, and, and given the Indian ethnicity and the Indian roots, uh, you know, like you say, you can take the... Indian out of India, but you can't take yes. India out of the Indian, so to yep. speak, right? Yep. Uh, I, in anything I do, I continue to believe that India will play a large part in employment generation, yes. value creation in right. some way, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. So you're also an avid golf player. Well, unfortunately not a good golf player, but <laughs> yes, you're right, an avid golf player. I love the game. I love being outdoors. Uh, uh, you know, it's... Uh, uh, you know, it's a good healthy exercise. You do yes. walk for four and a half yes. hours or so yeah. uh, with the game. And I hope to improve. And uh, right now I'm still at the stage where I'm playing maybe three to four times a month. I'm hoping to ratchet it up to eight to ten times as my workload gets yes. lighter. Yes. And uh, hopefully at that point of time I will get better. Uh, well, you're, you're always hard on yourself. So I'm guessing when you say you're not that good, you're probably, what's your handicap? About a 14 now, I think 14. See? You know, it's... I'm a perfect, like I used to call it, an executive <laughs> golfer, you know, where without uh, making too much of an effort, my client will win, you know, so I don't have to throw the game, you know. Well, for you the have client to be good for that too. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't have to throw the game, you know, <laughs> but uh, he won't feel embarrassed about winning that, you know, he's playing against oh, a guy who like, can't yeah. hit the ball, right, you know, so that's something which is definitely there. So, that, that, was, that was a good uh, learning moment for some others that are trying to win over some executives. Uh, <laughs> Any other practical and philosophical advice for people who are kind of sitting on the fence trying to become an entrepreneur or thinking about entrepreneurship uh, or someone who already is an entrepreneur and could use some, uh, you know, insights from, from your experience? Well, you know, if you're thinking of becoming an entrepreneur, you shouldn't, in my mind. Yes. Because uh, I remember somebody came up to me and says, you know, Fanish, I'm wondering whether I should do this <laughs> and so on and so forth. I said, no, you shouldn't. He said, you haven't even heard the idea. I said, no, it doesn't matter, you shouldn't. Because if you're an entrepreneur, you're committed you, to yes. what you want to do. Right. You actually believe you can change the world with whatever and your so idea true. is. Yes. And you should be all in. So there, there isn't, uh, so this thinking about sitting on the fence, in my mind, you're not an entrepreneur, right? You should yes. go in, uh, all in. Like when I had that idea with Quintin, I just you went just all went in. It, it was just no yeah. doubt about it, right? Uh, that that's the way I want to do it. Uh, uh, and I think my advice to entrepreneurs would be, you know, it is too much pressure to do everything yourself. So right. build a good team around yes. you. And uh, be careful on how you select your team because mm -hmm. it's not just friends you want to select. It's people who are on the same wavelength in terms of thinking right. and who are willing to last uh, the number of years or whatever it takes right. to make something successful. Yeah. Um, that's something that, that was an interesting life lesson from Quintent. Mm -hmm. I actually found the acquisition of iGate. Everybody said, hey, finish, we should do this because, you know, uh, guess what? Uh, We're getting tons of money right away because yeah. the acquisition is happening. Uh, plus, you're continuing to run iGate and yes. we have a larger platform to run and yes. so on. And guess what? All of my other partners disappeared within one or two years. Wow. Uh, after that, you know, they all encashed and they all disappeared. So, but I think they were just not ready to run that long battle. Right. 
uh, or that long road. So you know, it, it, it and building a company in my mind is more like a mid to long distance running, right. not a sprint. Yes. And I think so. That's something that you just need the right partners for that and the right pacers for that. That is awesome. Well, thank you so much, Vanish, for being with us on this show. My pleasure, completely, Nathan. It was Seen a, pleasure a pleasure to be here. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. Super. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>